Thank you, Brent. And to the ladies who've joined us at the back there, welcome. Our guest speaker, keynote speaker this year is Dr. Imte Suleiman. He needs no introduction. I am not going to tell you everything he's done because we could be here for the next three weeks. What I can say is that if he ran the roads department, the police department, Eskom, and everything else, there, there would be no need for us to even have Congress because everything would be working. Dr. Suleiman, I'd like you to come forward so long, please. And um, we, we look forward to your presentation. We, we're very proud to have you here with us. You passed a comment, uh, what's some of your program of yours on television the other day, where you said you had five daughters, if I remember correctly, and the youngest was your boss. Well, seven years, old. seven years old. Well, good luck to you. I've got a, a wife and one daughter, and I'm bald, so good luck to you with five daughters. Doc, Dr. Sutliwan, welcome, and we really look forward to your address today. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. The smallest one is seven years old and she, she likes to travel with me. So she came with me to Hermanas three weeks ago, and she sits in a plane alone because she decided last minute she's coming. So somebody makes arrangements for us to sit together, and she says no. She's sitting next to the guy, teaching her chess on, on the iPad. So she's learning that from him. And then he asked her, like, where are you going to? She said, I'm going to Hermanas on a business trip. <laughs> <laughs> she's seven years old, and she's like that all the time. Thank you very much. Uh, um, special greetings to Brian and Joe Hull. I've met them here and I've never met them before. Their daughter is one of my team members. She's an intensivist, very active, has come to me with many disasters, highly skilled per person, one of the first doctors in South Africa to get recognized for environmental interventions. You know, she got a special degree in that, and she's a very important team member to us. So very nice meeting you too. Wherever I go, I get the same kind of question. Is there hope for the country? What's the way forward? Is there gonna be civil unrest? Are we gonna have total shutdown? Are we gonna have blackout? What's gonna happen? We have, what, what will destroy any society and people is negative mindset. We have many challenges, yes. What has compounded those challenges are the events for the last four years more so in KZN. In 2019, with Cyclone Idai hitting Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe, we got hit with severe floods in Durban, caused huge damage to infrastructure and displaced people. In 2020, COVID destroyed the whole world. And COVID is something where we have not recovered from. The mental health issue with COVID has been a huge matter for our country and the world. And any even after that, you can't deal with because you haven't dealt with the chaos of COVID. Doctors saw their friends die, family members die, and the worst part of the death was it was a lonely death. You died in isolation. You died all alone. Your family members couldn't be with you, and you couldn't hold their hand in the last few minutes, in the last hour. And that has caused a huge psychological impact that has affected our functioning for future issues. We lost close to 1,000 doctors 2,000 nurses, I mean 2,000 teachers, and many, many others in, in the in corporate world. We know it's a serious problem because Len is my team member. And as you travel you know, with, with the medical teams across the world, they tell you they don't need counseling. It's fine, they're macho. They can deal with any situation, bombs, explosions, burnt out people, they can deal with it. For, but for the first time in my history, on the medical chats all over the country, I saw a request. Healthcare workers and doctors who generally never ask for assistance wrote there. It was very subliminally. Uh, is anybody offering yoga? Does anybody do breathing exercises? Can we do mindfulness? Is there a retreat we can go to? And then they ask, do you know a good psychologist or a good psychiatrist? If the healthcare workers are affected and tormented to that level, the rest of the population is far worse off. And if you haven't dealt with that, any disaster is too big for you to handle after that. 
And uh, coming out of that, we get hit with the civil unrest in, 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 in July 2021, which put a lot of fear into a lot of people. There was no need to have real fear, fear and I'll explain that a little later. In 2022, we got hit again in KZN by floods far bigger than we've ever had in our history. And huge destruction, and we're still coming out of the other 19 floods, 20 COVID, 21 civil unrest and floods again. And 2023, it's, it's a load shedding in ESCOM. And people are worried, you know, is there going to be civil unrest? Is the grid going to survive? Are the country going to survive? Yes, the country is going to survive. People say the word failed state. There's no such thing as the failed state. Failed state is a relative term. Is it a political issue, an economic issue, a religious issue? What is this? I'm not a tourist. I'm a disaster tourist. I specialize in going to chaos, mayhem, disorder. That's what I see. I don't see normal things. And I've been to many, many countries. We've intervened in 45 countries. And we've been everywhere. We're nowhere near a failed state. Yes, we have problems. We can't run away from the fact that we have problems. But no problem is un insurmountable. Let's just do a comparison. 2020 and now. In 2020, there were no cars on the road. What a lockdown. The hotels were empty. The planes were not flying. There was no car guard. There was no waiter. Nobody going to the restaurant and the bar. All in bed and breakfast closed. No God economy. Thousands of jobs lost. At the same time, we had a drought in the Northern Cape, but parts of the Southern Cape. All that kind of chaos. We survived it. Do you see that now? Senton at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon during lockdown, didn't have any car in the road. You could even see the cockroach on the hotel. The rat and the cat and everything else, but no people. More damage was done during lockdown than now during load shedding. And I spoke about a positive mindset. If your mind is messed up, no matter how strong your body is, it won't function. Because a negative mind destroys the entire soul and being of a person. And that's why you deal it with stages step by step. For the last 15 years, our biggest problem is that we left everything to government. They're going to solve the problem. And we sat on the wayside. White people were scared to talk. Because you speak, they tell you white monopoly capital. Racist, prejudice of the past. You got benefits, so you get too scared to speak and you stay quiet and you can't talk out. That has made you very passive and scared to say anything. But in recent times, those things have changed. The government can't use race as an issue anymore. Because black people themselves are saying, how do we make the country survive and function? Nobody's worried about color anymore. They worried about service delivery. If all of us take out our branding, agri SA, gift of the givers, government departments, SAPS, SNDF, RTI, take all that branding off. Put everybody in the ground together. All of us, we won't know who's government, who's a politician, who's a farmer, who's an NGO, who's a doctor, but we will know one thing, we are all South African. And as South Africans, as a human, whether you're the president, a minister, a premier, agriculture, corporate, what do you have in mind? How can I live in safety, peacefully, have education, have health, have healing, have neighborliness and growth. Every South African has that. So how do we work towards that? We need to understand very clearly that the country does not belong to the government. It's not their country. Nowhere in the world does the country belong to the government. They are only administrators of who put them there. They got to do what we ask them to do. They don't tell us what to do. We need to change our thinking and how we do things. How we select people to represent us in parliament. Are they representing us or are they representing themselves? You need to make that clear. And that's all dependent on you. Ah, we're not gonna vote. Makes no sense. It's pointless. Nothing's gonna happen. Of course nothing's gonna happen if you don't do anything. But if you choose the right candidate, that candidate can make a difference because the candidate is supposed to go to serve you, not everybody else or himself for that matter. The second positive point you've got to think about 
Everybody says government is corrupt. How are we going to work with them? Government is not corrupt. There's people inside government that are corrupt. You get corruption in the, in the corporate sector too. A lot of the corruption in government is created by the corporates. We need to fix the system. Don't say everybody in government is corrupt. There's a lot of good people wanting to do a lot of good things. And then we say, you can't save the country. The SAPS is useless. They're all corrupt. They're part of the criminal gangs and part of the, the mess. Everybody in SAPS is not corrupt. There's a lot of good people from here, General Ankata, from PE. He's a dynamic, dedicated policeman who will clean up the area. He was committed to fight gangsterism and corruption within the old police. In Free State, recently, at an awards event, an Africana lady cop in one of the award categories wins the award. What was the award for? There were a lot of categories, but that particular award category that Africana lady won the award for was what for? She exposed corruption in the SAPS. This is a police lady who exposed corruption in the SAPS. Not only did she expose corruption, she even got the cops locked up. And for that, she got a big applause from the entire SAPS sitting there. Because believe it or not, like you and me want things to go the right way, there are people in government, politicians, civil servants, police services, everybody who wants things to go right in the right way. That is all an aspect of spirituality. Again, about government and us. We have to get involved. You see, 7.4 million people's taxes can't look after 65 million people. It's impossible. Take the country and offer it to Canada. Give it to Germany. Give it to the US. Give it to Australia. I say, take it. It's yours. You can have it. They'll tell us, do you think you'll be mad? How can 7.4 million people's taxes look after 65 million people? We won't make right. We won't be able to do it. So we have an obligation of those of us who have to help with government to start pulling people up. The only way to success is to put people up with you. When you pick people up, you grow with them and you go upwards. Otherwise, you get dragged down the opposite direction when you leave people alone who are falling apart. There is no other way of doing this. And then you will tell me, yes, I pay tax, company tax, super tax, VAT, fuel levy, this rates, this, that, the other. Yes, you do pay all that. It's correct. You do pay all of that. But again, it's not enough to cover the lives of 765 billion people. We need to take some facts, understand it very clearly. You see, people spoke about social unrest and civil unrest and, and chaos. There won't be chaos in this country. What you see is criminal activity. You need to separate a third force, criminal activity, and uprising from the masses. It's three different things. During the time of the, they called it an insurrection, and I'll explain that just now, in 2021. They say trucks are burning at Moy River Toll. Trucks are always burning at Moy River Toll. What's new? It's been happening all the time. It's not something new that happened suddenly at that time. Then they tell you, see, there's service delivery protests. We've had more than 5,000 civil delivery protests over the last few years. So what's new? They tell you it's an insurrection. What's an insurrection? An insurrection is where you attack the presidential quarters, parliament, union buildings, defense force, police, RTI, airports, harbor, electricity, dams, water. That's an insurrection. And you don't do it in one province. You do it in the entire country. Where in the history of the world have you heard of an insurrection where people go and loot the mall? Are they going to take the country over by looting a mall? That's crazy. There's no such thing. And you see, the guys who planned this were very, very clever. They said they're freeing Zuma. Poor Zuma didn't even know that it was being done in his name. He didn't know. He would never agree to that. I know the man personally. He would never agree to that. They wanted to show they had political power. 
it actually exposed their weakness. Because they didn't have enough people to get into the streets. So you tell people, go take free stuff. You'll get thousands of people doing that. Whether it's South America, Europe, or Asia, the same thing will happen. People are going to take free stuff at times of economic crisis. It will happen. They didn't have the forces or the numbers. It actually showed an inherent weakness in the people I call the traitors and anti-patriots. We need to get back to the philosophy of patriotism. This country is ours. We were born here, we love here, we will die here. Just take the drive from PE to Jeffreys Bay. What a magnificent drive. Failed state, we say. Emirates told me pre-COVID, they had 49 flights a week to South Africa. They're already on 42 flights a week to South Africa. Are all mad people coming to a failed state? For the ICC, all international conferences are booked up till 2026. How many international sporting events are going to take place here? Foreigners are buying houses in South Africa. You get scared, you say, oh, so many South Africans are leaving. Did they tell you how many South Africans are going to come back? And how many South Africans are coming back already? Why are they coming back? You think the worst possible time. Why are they coming back? Because they've seen what they don't want outside. They see a country of harmony and peace and progress and weather. It's not only about the weather. It's not about their mountain and sea and lakes. It's about spirituality. It's about faith. It's about belief in God. It's about the spirit of Ubuntu, which this country has more than any other country in the world. So when those people went to the malls, they were not violent. The violence came afterwards. But the guys made to cause conflict and hey, mayhem. Those poor people went to the mall. A two-year-old child, a lady on a walking stick, no stones, no bombs, no guns, no knockers. They didn't go to harm anybody. Child takes a pair of shoes. Somebody takes a tin of fish. Somebody takes a packet of chips. Somebody takes a new branded shirt, and they walk out. The mall that was on TV almost every day, Brookside Mall, Checkers, in Peter Marisburg. I live one kilometer from that mall. On the road, they were walking, thousands of them. They didn't harm anybody. What the fridge on their back, and a DSTV in the end, and a big TV, and a stove. They waving to you as they're walking. This is not like violent people? No. They had great remorse few days after that happened and realized they were used by the traitors and anti-patriots. All that equipment was given back, three, it was taken back three days later. And the regret was they were used. And why do I say, so that was not an insurrection. Those people were not violent, didn't cause any damage. The real damage took place after hours. People came with trucks, and they knew that this warehouse had 2,000 pallets of these goods. That warehouse had 500 pallets of that goods. The biggest theft took place by rich people after hours. And the biggest culprits were those that came with German cars to steal stuff in the day. What hunger were they suffering from? People say it's because hunger the country is going to explode. Well, then we are 15 years behind time. Because Eastern Cape is suffering from hunger from the time of the WSSD. The World Summit on Sustainable Development, more than 20 years. In 2002, when we had the summit, in the front page of the Sunday Times, 167 children died of starvation in the Eastern Cape. Right as I'm talking to you, in Transca and Butterworth, they're dying of starvation. Starvation is quite normal for them not to eat food for days. Do you see people burning shops, houses, cars burning the road? They don't do that because it's not in their way. Let's go back to the greatest and the most significant event in the history of this country. 27 April, 1994. Not because the black government replaced the white government. No, governments come and change all the time. There's no, no big deal about that. What was significant was the behavior of the people. You see, the world's international media all came here. What war rooms because they want to watch how this country was going to explode. You were told, buy food, stockpile, 
keep your passport, documents, jewelry, money ready. You're going to fly from the country. Very risky, very dangerous. The people are going to erupt. And all the media were waiting for this. They lack sensationalism. It was probably the most boring story in world history. Because nothing happened. But in nothing that happened, everything happened. The people showed you their true quality. The masses. Everybody tries to make negative thoughts about the masses. Understand this very clearly. You need to get your psyche correct. So what did they do? They stood in long lines in the heat with discipline, obedience, respect, and with hope. Mandela always said, the people have spoken. They spoke that day without the words. The behavior said, yes, we got shot on June 16. We got shot on Chapel. We had to carry the passbook. We got detention without trial. Our family members have disappeared. Our children died. We were locked up. We were oppressed. But we will not burn the country. We will not take revenge. We will not burn any shop. We won't turn against our employer. We won't turn against the correctional services or the police or the military. We will rebuild this country together. They made the supreme sacrifice. Nobody seems to see that. In 95, at great risk to his political career, political career, Mandela wore Francois Pirard's jersey. Rugby, I'm a very blunt guy, sorry. Rugby is regarded as a sport of the oppressor. And yet, Mandela wore the jersey because he understood clear leadership. He could have won the battle and let everybody erupt and make violence but he would have lost the war. I come from countries where neighbor turned against neighbor. Same religion, same color, same street, same nationality, turned against each other. 300 years, you will not fix that problem. You will never fix that problem because the revenge and hatred will be too far for too much. It will just keep going from generation to generation. We're fortunate. We have people who are forgiving in nature, who want to work together, who will not destroy the country. And that's why it carried on in 2021. They were so remorseful at what have we done here? This is not in our way. My domestic passed on a few years ago. Her son was one of the looters. He came, my wife called him home and she told him, did you loot? And she said, yes. My wife is like the FBI. You worry about your wife, wait till you meet mine. <laughs> And she tell him, what is looting? He said, stealing. My wife asked him one question. If your mother was alive today, what would she have done for what you did? He said, my mother would have killed me. Because my mother was a church-going person. My mother was a very religious person. My mother will never allow this. And that same sentiment goes across every single sphere of this country. People, they looted, they caused chaos within themselves, but they had great remorse. And something else happened that same time of 2021 to show the goodness of this country. You see, I told you in 94, people didn't burn the country. In 2021, they looted, but they were remorseful. How is the response of those people that were looted? Corp to South Africa called, and they said, we lost our warehouse. We lost our goods. We lost our truck. We lost our forklift. Our people are displaced. They won't be able to work for months. What do you need and how much do you need to bring help to all those people who are part of, of the looting, those who looted and those who lost? because there was no more shop, no more groceries, no more food. Everything became difficult. Corporate South Africa had the same heart that the people had in 94, that we are the giving nation, that we build and we don't break and we don't destroy. Three days after the looting, if you walked in the streets of KZN, black, white, Indian, colored, Pakistani, Indian, Bangladesh, Somali, Ethiopian, walk next to each other, you'll swear nothing happened. People helped each other with bread, with water, 
what food, what support in the garage. Absolute respect between each group. Go to the other countries. You think that's possible? You will kill each other in the streets because of the nature of the people. You will never see this anywhere else in the world because we are not a nation given to destruction. And that is driven by faith, by prayer, by God consciousness. In 2022, when the floods came, April 11th, at night at half past five, when the flood waters rose eight meters in 45 minutes in Tongat, I expected people to say, send a helicopter, send a boat, send divers, send earthquake moving equipment, the boundary wall has fallen down, people are trapped. No such requests. The only request till one o'clock in the morning, or the only calls till one o'clock in the morning was from corporate South Africa. What do you need and how much do you need? Now when you have that kind of compassion and that kind of caring, working both ways, you fix the country. And to show the consistency, in 2020 when COVID came, for the first time, CEOs and MDs of companies called, not CSI managers. CSI was put up because it was a government requirement. Nobody really took it seriously, to be honest. All they wanted to know is how many BE points, tax certificate, do we get a write-up in the media? The type of project was irrelevant, didn't even make sense after the time. And during COVID, the MDs call said, forget about BE points, forget about tax certificate, forget about write-up. How do you save our people and how do you save our country? When that compassion runs across all people of all races and all religions, your country can never collapse. We have an Arabic term called baraka. Baraka means bounties and blessings in abundance without measure. One plus one becomes 100 because of the nature of the heart and the nature of sincerity. The masses prove themselves again on 20th March 2023, a political party said, we're gonna have national shutdown. It's our right to march. If you don't march and don't close your shops, there'll be looting. Who are you? To tell us this, since when this became your country? Nobody dictates to us what to do. You wanna march? Please feel free, it's a free country. But don't dictate to other people to close the shops. We will go to the shop and we will go to hospital. And we will go to schools and universities, and we will go to the ECDs. Nobody's gonna to dictate to us, this country does not belong to you. It belongs to me, and to you, and to 65 million South Africans. And what happened that day? The masses in the country showed the party the middle finger. We're not gonna walk in the streets. We're not gonna be used the second time around. Go to Amlazi, Inanda, and Kwamashu at night, on the 19th of March. Old ladies were sitting around the malls with knobkiris and saying what happened in 2021, it's never gonna happen again. We will not allow anybody to do this. And in 2021, who played a vital role in stopping what was going on? The people we just don't like, the taxi drivers. They made sure that this will not happen. You see, I got a spiritual teacher and he always says, Look at the good in a person. Never look for the negative. Never promote the negative. Always look at the positive. So even a person irritates you, nags you, seems to be doing the wrong thing, always look at the soul and find something good. And if you keep speaking about the good, the good goes up and the negative goes down and the person becomes a better person. That's the law of the universe. If you send positive thoughts into the universe, positive things happen. You're positive that this country will survive, this country will survive. It will be the greatest country on earth. Go around in the last few months. I mean, if this country is a failed state, what are 50,000 Afrikaners doing in Loftus Festival two weeks ago? And going all crazy and excited about a box meeting Australia? Would you see that in a failed state? Or you will see total depression and sadness and people's spirits killed. We landed in a place called Palompon in the Philippines. Typhoon Haiyan, 2013. We were the first team in the world that got there. 
As we got to the, uh, entering the, 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 this island, the mayor, the councillors, and the leaders of the town came to the front, very depressed. You don't, see, you don't hear any sound in the island. You don't see any people moving around. You don't see any activity. You see people all depressed, nothing happening. What happened? The typhoon destroyed a lot of houses, killed people. But more than that, they're going to shut the main hospital down, the only hospital down in the city, because the roof was severely damaged. You shut down the hospital, you shut down life. Nobody had initiative to do things for themselves. Everybody was just totally depressed. I have Afrikaner guys in my team, guys who know engineering, who are good at building, who can make things happen. And they asked me what we're going to do. I said, we're going to fix the roof of this hospital. In three days, in 72 hours, they repaired 1,000 square meters of the roof. They started fixing the hospital, painting, glass, tiling, equipment. And as we started, suddenly in the entire island, we started getting hammers and nails, and people started knocking. Our job is to bring hope, to inspire, to return faith to the people. And we as South Africans can do that. We are resilient, we can do anything, we can fix anything. No problem is insurmountable. When ESCOM has load shedding, it's to prevent their grid from collapsing. That's why they have load shedding. We will not reach that point. And already 4,000 megawatts have been created outside ESCOM. And that number is going to rise where people will get off the grid. And there'll be less pressure on the grid. And the country will get fixed. We've got the last 30 days to go to survive till 31st August. We will survive. This country will survive. We have absolutely nothing to fear. This is the great greatest country on earth. No country that goes without its challenges and its problems. We will fix the country. But we need to do this together. There's no skills in government. There's not enough experience. All the best people are gone. We need the experienced people to come back. We need the engineers, the teachers, the doctors, the farmers. But we need to share. To hold, to make this country survive, we need to hold hands with those who don't have and carry them up with us. You see, we have a teaching. What you don't use is not yours. So if I give all of you two billion rand each, you'll be very happy. How many lifetimes is it going to take you to spend that money? Hundred lifetimes. Yeah, you can buy five houses, but you can only sleep in one bedroom. You can buy ten cars, you can only drive one. The other nine, the battery is going to go flat. And then you'll find the mechanic to come sort it out. All the headache. Yeah, and you overeat, you get sick, you end up in hospital, and you're paying the medical bill. Doesn't make any sense. From a spiritual point of view, there's always a blessing in sharing. The more you give, the more you get. Don't look at it in money terms. There's much more to life than money. There's happiness, contentment, children growing up the right way, family goodness, calmness, prosperity in business, relationship between husband and wife and brothers and sisters. That's what we call baraka. So let me go back to where it all started and then I'll finish off there. You see, 6 August 1992 is the official date that Gift of the Givers was created. The unofficial date is very spiritual. It goes back to 1985. Gift of the Givers is not my organization. I didn't get up one morning and say to myself, ah, I think today I'll form an organization. Give it a name, get some founder members, write a constitution, and write down one, two, three, four, and five. This is what I'm going to do. It never happened like that. In 1985, I was doing internship in King Edward Hospital in Durban. And like all young people, I had plans for the future. So I said, next year, I will be a medical officer. Then I'll become a registrar. And then I'll become a specialist in internal medicine. I'll be a consultant. It never happened that way. There was no opportunity for me to study further. There was no post. I couldn't make progress. I had two choices, much like what everybody in the country faced. I can sit in the corner and mope and cry and roll and be depressed and make cartwheels and say, oh, the world is finished now. Or I can say, God, you've given me faith. You've given me a brain, intellect, and wisdom. I need to make a plan, look at something different. So I decided I'll go into private practice. 
something that I did not want to do. But life has to carry on. So I said, I'll go into private practice. We have a teaching. We don't pray for what we want. We pray for what is good for us. Because what you want may not necessarily be good for you. So when there's a road bump and there's difficulty, look at it again. Man, you're going the wrong road. The thing doesn't work out. Every time I try to do it, there's an obstacle, obstacle, obstacle. God is telling you something, my friend. Look at it properly. You're doing something wrong. Find another path. There's too many potholes on that side. Go somewhere else. Look at it very clearly with hope. And you will find the solution. So January 86, I decided to leave Durban. My mother passed on in 1984 in Durban. And I moved to Marisburg. My wife's family is from there. I set up private practice. The week I moved to Marisburg in January 86, the new neighbor now comes to me, he's a butcher. And he says, I got a South African guy that came from Pretoria. He was in America. He's coming to teach French at the university. He bought meat from me, but he needs a doctor. So I meet Miller. And I treat him a few times. And then one day he tells me an unusual story. He says, I was in America on a scholarship. And I was walking through the streets of New York. And that one day I was feeling so dejected, depressed, down, not sure. My soul is empty. My spirit is empty. I'm not sure why I'm even living. What am I, do am I doing here? He says, from the corner of his eye, he sees a man looking at him. He doesn't know this man. He's never seen him before. His heart tells him, follow the man. We have another teaching. When in doubt, listen to the heart. Follow the heart, not the head. So he follows the man. And the man walks into St. John the Divine, a huge church in New York. And when he gets in, he realizes the man he followed into the church was a Muslim, a Turk, a Sufi master, a master of spirituality. In the church, that same Sufi master then makes a zikr. A zikr in Islamic terminology is the recitation of God's names in Arabic. In other scriptures, you would say God, the one and only, kind, compassionate, merciful, loving, eternal, absolute, cherisher, nourisher, sustainer, creator of the universe, creator of the heavens and the earth, you say things like that. But he says, there were Jewish rabbi in the church, Christian priests, Hindu pandits, people of other faiths, and people of no faith. They didn't understand about religion. They all participated in the zikr, unanimously. All of them. And I looked at this and I'm thinking, how is this possible? And then I understood the thinking of the Christian elders of the church. The Christian elders of the church understood real religion. That religion is harmony. It's the unity of people. Unity of mankind, real unity does not cause conflict. People have been telling us religion is the source of conflict. Religion is not the source of conflict. People who leave religion create conflict. Why do you blame the religion? When lawyers steal from the road accident fund, do you blame the legal profession or do you blame the lawyer? When doctors make malpractice, do you blame the medical profession or do you blame the doctor? So what's the difference with religion? The people who lose the path are the problem. And I understood this further. Mother tells me to go to Istanbul. The spiritual teacher is from there. He tells me that in 96, in, in 86. I tell him, Muller, I haven't even seen Cape Town. When am I gonna to get to Turkey? He says something very profound. He said, what God wills happens. If God wills this is gonna be a great country, this is going to be a great country, and it will be a great country. And it is a great country. He said, there's a time and a place. The time and the place was August 91. My wife and I landed there. What Miller saw in New York, we saw in Istanbul. What he saw in the church, we saw in the Muslim Sufi place. But the time that we saw was far more difficult than the time that he saw. Because our time was post Gulf War. Samuel Huntington spoke of a clash of civilizations during the Gulf War. The perception was Christians, Hindus, and Muslims on one side, or Christian Hindus and Jews on one side, and Muslims on the other side. East on one side, West on the other side. 
and coming from an apartheid past didn't help. And when you walked inside there, you see Jews, Christians, Hindus, Americans, Russians, people from Sweden, Germany, Belgium, Norway, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, and Africa. All in a Muslim holy place, believers and non-believers, religion and non-religion. No friction, no discord. Nobody taking his book and putting it down somebody else's throat. Yeah, you must follow this. Nothing. Only respect and understanding. The teacher saw the shock on my face. How is this ever possible? He said, what do you see? I said, I'm really confused. How are people from different religions and different nationalities in a Muslim holy place? We fought with them all over the world. Why are they here? He said, my son, you see right. Mankind is one single nation, he said. The God of all mankind is one. We just call him by different names. Any Imam, Sheikh, priest, Pandit, Sufi, that promotes violence, extremism, discord, chaos, confrontation or disorder is not a man of God. Don't follow him. Any person who preaches love, kindness, compassion, and mercy is a man of God. Follow him. If all of us do that in our country, if all of us forget the race and labels and, agenda and, and titles and branding and do that, you will find the social cohesion, you will find the love, you will find the progress and the prosperity. I leave Turkey, August 92. The heart has been yearning the whole year since I left that place. I saw something that touched my soul. 6 August 92, the official date of Gift of the Givers formation. I get to Turkey, they have the zikr again at 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. at night. The spiritual teacher, after the zikr, picks his head up, makes eye contact with me. I'm on the other side of the room, and he looks heavenwards at the same time. In fluent Turkish, and I don't speak a word of Turkish. But I understood every single word that he said in Turkish that night. He said, my son, I'm not asking you. I'm instructing you to form an organization. The name in Arabic will be Wakful Waqifin. Translated, gift of the givers. You will serve all people of all races, all religions, all colors, all classes, all cultures of any geographical location and of any political affiliation, but you will serve them unconditionally. You will expect nothing in return, not even a thank you. In fact, in what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life, expect to get a kick up your back. If you don't get a kick up your back, regard it as a bonus. Serve people with love, kindness, compassion, and mercy. And remember, the dignity of man is foremost. Race difference will not destroy a country. Color difference will not destroy a country. Class difference will not destroy a country. ESCOM will not destroy a country. What will destroy a country is when people lose dignity. When you lose dignity, there are no consequences because there is nothing more to lose. You have lost everything once you lose dignity. And when that happens, we are in serious trouble because the amount of negative energy that will be created by a loss of dignity will cause mayhem, chaos, confusion, and disorder. We are nowhere near that. But intelligent people don't allow that to happen. We make sure we prevent such a situation from happening. And the only way to do that is to share, to hold hands, to love people, and to work together with government, because alone, nobody can do this. We have to do this together. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and provide water to the thirsty. And in everything that you do, be the best at what you do, not because of ego. That is the biggest obstacle on earth. Ego destroys relationship between husband and wife, between parents and children between directors, people in the church, 
in the NGO sector, in the corporate world, in the government. If anything destroys progress, it's ego. Not because of ego, but because you're dealing with human life, human emotion, human suffering, and human dignity. My son, this is an instruction for you for the rest of your life. I was 30 years old. And then he said, remember that whatever you do is done through you and not by you. It's our anniversary on Sunday. 31 years. I'm intelligent enough to know that the kind of things that people think that I do is not humanly possible. There's a hand above that takes care of every single thing. I told you he spoke in Turkish. I don't understand Turkish. I understood everything he said in Turkish. And I asked him, I said, how come when you speak Turkish, I understand? And other people speak Turkish, I don't understand. He said, my son, when the hearts connect and the souls connect, the words become understandable. I asked him, there's a bit of a problem here. What exactly am I supposed to do? I'm a doctor in private practice. I have three surgeries in a place called Peter Marisburg in South Africa. What am I supposed to do and when am I supposed to do this? Like after hours, public holidays, long weekends, school holidays, when? He told me one line, you will know. For 31 years, I do know. What to do, how to do, what to touch, what not to touch. It sounds philosophical. Let me give you a clear example. January 6, 2014, a group calls us from Yemen and says, you're looking for two South Africans taken hostage. We said, yes. Come tomorrow morning, 7 January, 10 o'clock to Aden. My team member from Yemen goes. They allow him to communicate with me. He walks into the room. We don't know who took them. Pierre and Yolanda, Yolanda Koki. And they tell him, do you know who we are? We are Al-Qaeda. And you know what we're capable of. That was his welcome. What do you want? We want the two South Africans. Let's start with the lady. You can have her. Three million US dollars. Four days. No training by the FBI. No training by MI6. No training by state security. No degree. No PhD in hostage negotiations. In four days, we knew exactly what to do. In four days, we took out Yolande Koki unharmed, unconditionally, no ransom, and we pulled her out from Al-Qaeda in four days with no training. We knew exactly what to do with no training. The teacher said, you will know. In fact, the moment I walked out of that place on 6 August 1992, it came to me by inspiration respond to the civil war in Bosnia. The same month, I took in 32 containers of aid all alone into war torn Bosnia. Three months later, I took in eight containers of winter items. The chill factor in Eastern Europe in winter can reach minus 21 degrees. And the following year, because he opened my mind, don't be prejudiced, don't be stereotyped, don't look at all people in a negative way, open your heart to everyone. I worked with an Africana company Afrit from the Vietnam Engineering. You've seen it on the trucks, the trailers, Afrit on the road. And we designed the world's first containerized mobile hospital. A product of South African technology, built in South Africa and Pretoria, a world first taken from Africa into Europe because we worked together across race and religion and had no boxes, no stereotypes, no ticking every corner. We worked together as human beings. And as a result of that, the CNN commentator said, the South African containerized mobile hospital is equal to any of the best hospitals in Europe. We have the skills. We have the training. We can make anything happen. I was invited by the Bosnian government in 2005. My family and I went. And they said, we identify South Africans with the giving of life because there were thousands of people that were saved in this hospital and thousands of children were born in this hospital. Thank you very, very much. The final part about something about the police people. Everybody say police is bad. A few years ago, a police van was driving from my hometown, Peter Bersberg, to Durban on the N3. On the road, the dog was running across. The police stopped, 
picked up the dog and put it safely on the side, not to harm itself and to cause chaos on the road. Nobody takes notice of that. In April 2022, when the floods came, a child and a grandfather drowned in Henley Dam near Peter Marisburg. A police lady diver dived in, not to take out a live person, to take out two deceased people, so that families can get closure. We all want closure, we all want burial, we want cremation, because that's part of who we are. The police diver drowned. She got two small kids at home. She go home and say, oh, you know, your mother, she's part of the SAPS, all corrupt, bad elements, criminal people. Is that the psyche you're gonna put in the child? No, it's not correct. In Ronzamo, April 2020, in Strand, lockdown level five. At eight o'clock, the police comes to my team and say, shut down. The old people are waiting in the queue. The queue, every person is one meter apart. It's social distancing, physical distancing. They're hungry, they haven't had food. It's ice cold. And police guys come and say, sorry, level five lockdown, that's the law. Ali was there, he calls me. I said, tell the SAPS, I'm not shutting down the program. They can lock us up, they can jump in the lake, fall in the sea, do what they want. I'm gonna break the law and they can do what they want. The police, to his credit, sits and thinks for a little while. And he says he's also going to break the law because people are important. He phones for reinforcements and he says, I need your guys' help here. These are old people. It's cold. Take the food parcel and let's take them to the house once they collect the food parcel. There's a lot of goodness in South Africans. We just need to be positive. At half past 12 in the morning, the last old lady takes a food parcel. And she says, I'm going home now to wake my grandchildren up. And we said, are you crazy? She said, when I left home this morning, my grandchildren looked at me with, with their eyes, with hope in their eyes that I'm bringing home something they haven't eaten in three days. If the police carried out the law, if he stopped us, we would have destroyed the grandmother, her soul, and the and grandchildren. But because of the goodness and graciousness in this country, it didn't happen. In July 2020, in Makanda, a small child comes to the soup kitchen queue, thin, freezing in the cold, no shoes, torn shirt, no jersey, no jacket, no hat. And it says, I'm very hungry, but I won't eat. Just give me a little bit. Would you rather give the food for me to take home for my mother my father, my brother, and my sister. They haven't eaten. The child became the sacrificial lamb. The child was sacrificing how adults would sacrifice. And the child was prepared to go even hungry so that the parents, the respect, and the brother and sister could eat. And of course, we wouldn't allow that. We gave food for everybody. These are the tragedies in our country which the government itself can't solve. Only we as human beings that sit together and hold hands together and share together can make it happen. To return dignity to the people, to work together, to support each other, we can build this country. I'm gonna give you a last example of the power of spirituality, and then I'm done. In November last year, my friend from Cape Town calls me, and he says, would you like to meet the new general manager of Turkish Airlines? He's from San Francisco, he's coming to Cape Town, he's gonna to be the new general manager. I told him, yes, as part of my job, we build networks. We meet ambassadors, we meet plane people, we meet we logistics, we meet equipment companies, and we do this, that, and the other. And yes, I want to meet him. I need an airline partner, I can't find the right one up till now. February 3, and I told him there's a time and a place. February 3rd, February 1st, I jump in a plane in Durban. And I'm about to fly, and I say, hey, let's check if the guy from Turkey is here. So I phone him. He says, yeah, I'm checking now. Gets back, yes, the guy is here. Can we meet tonight? Yes, half past nine, we'll have supper at the Turkish restaurant. I meet the general manager of Turkish Airlines. My first words to him, Sinan, I need an airline partner. In the event I need to move search and rescue equipment very quickly, personnel and canines, in case an earthquake hits a country. Four days later, an earthquake hits his country. On the 6th of February, the arrangements were made. 
such a rescue equipment, personnel, canines, all could move at speed because that relationship was sorted out on the 1st of February. I didn't plan that. Call me November last year. But five days before the earthquake, we were shown the way. Two days later, I sent the K-9 unit from the SAPS. And in the rubble, Donna, the dog of the Eastern Cape head of dog unit, Brigadier Vimla Mudli, picks up a live scent in the building. And eight days later, we pull out a live 90-year-old grandmother because of this dog in, in, the, in the earthquake itself. There were 12 teams there, 11 from government, from different governments in the world. We were the only non-government team in the area. We came with five dogs. They were stunned at our skill, at South African skill, at South African compassion, across race and religion. And one of the teams was the Bosnian team. And the Bosnian man comes, takes out a wallet, starts crying, takes out a picture, and shows my team leader the picture. Baby and mother. He said, and this guy is tall like this. He says, this baby is me. This lady is my mother. I know your guy's name. So he said, what do you mean? He said, you guys bought a hospital to Bosnia in 1993. I was born in that hospital. I will never forget people of South Africa. What's the chances of that happening? Earthquakes all over the world. Damages all over the world. The man that's born in the hospital that gift of the givers took across lands up and meets my team members in an earthquake in Turkey. Ladies and gentlemen, fate and four other important qualities are important to fix ourselves and our country. Spirituality, morality, values, and ethics. All of us have that in our religions. All of us have had that in our scriptures, in our books. We need to return to it. We need to train our children and our grandchildren. There's no need to go anywhere. This country is going nowhere. Have both feet in this country, work hard and together. We will fix this country. It will be the best country in the world. Thank you very much. Dr. Suleiman, that is actually quite mind-boggling what you people do. And I think the bottom line is civil society, people like us, who are perhaps more fortunate than others, we need to have a backbone and we need to stand up not for what's white or black or anything, but we need to stand up for what is right. And there are lots of people who do have a backbone in this country. But it's time we pulled it together. It's not the first time things have been tight. Won't be the last time that there will be problems in this country and negativity. But it's us as the leadership of this country who need to have your positive mindset and make it work and pull the bar through the drift, as they used to say. For your time and your effort, thank you very much, Dr. Suleiman.